in the in the story of the wasteland, especially the version of it that we get in the Elucidation, one of the one of the oddest and rarest of the Grail legend, which I which I discuss at length, which I also include a translation of in, as an appendix. The we have a a portrayal of ecological ta- catastrophe. We have a situation where, due to human action, there are no leaves on the trees, there is no water in the rivers, not a blade of grass grows. It's really harrowing. And so this is the condition of the wasteland. This is the thing that the quest for the grail is meant to heal. Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather. And in this episode, I am joined by author John Michael Greer to talk about his book, The Ceremony of the Grail, Ancient Mysteries, Gnostic Heresies, and the Lost Rituals of Freemasonry. Not only does John discuss the Grail legends, but how information is encoded in myth, the importance and power of ceremony and ritual, the necessity of asking the right questions, and why we should not be waiting for Galahad to come and save us. Also, please be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast on whatever platform you use to listen to or view podcasts. Your support is truly appreciated. A widely respected author and blogger in fields ranging from nature spirituality to the future of industrial society, John Michael Greer is the author of more than 70 books, including 16 novels and blogs weekly at ecosophia.net. He lives in Rhode Island with his wife, Sarah. He joins me today to discuss his latest publication, The Ceremony of the Grail, Ancient Mysteries, Gnostic Heresies, and the Lost Rituals of Freemasonry. John Michael Greer, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you very much for having me on. Well, thank you for being on. It is my pleasure. I told you before I hit record, I'm a fan of your work. I've read a few of your books. And I've had an interest in the grail myth since I was a young boy. So I'm really excited to talk to you today. And I know I'm going to be in good hands. I respect your scholarship. And so to begin, I think that with any mythology, there are legends, there are layers to the legends, excuse me. And I think most people likely relate the grail to King Arthur and Christianity, with the grail being the cup that Jesus drank from during the Last Supper. What I get from your book is that there are elements of the grail stories that might predate Christianity, and the grail wasn't always considered a cup. So I know there's a lot here, but I thought I'd ask you to give a brief walkthrough of the Grail legend and maybe kind of go into a bit of the layers of the mythology. Okay, sure. Let's we can start with the most with the most basic version, the version that we have in the very earliest redactions of the Grail Grail legend that's come down to us. We have a knight. Usually it's a young knight. It is a clueless knight. This is Percival, who is the, the, the clueless idiot of the Arthurian legend until, as Wolfram von Parkerswald, Wolfram von Eschenbach finally says, excuse me, he becomes slowly wise. So he's out. He's doing as knights do in Arthurian legend, riding on a quest, and he comes to a castle. He is in, by the way, in the midst of a wasteland. He has not seen another human being for days except for one guy with a king sitting in a fishing boat, fishing, who told him to keep on going on that way. He comes to this castle. He goes into the castle. He's welcomed by the castle, by the people in the castle. He is you know, taken to a banquet where this, the same king he saw in the boat is sitting there. And they're getting ready for the banquet. And all of a sudden, everything gets very quiet. And a procession goes through in perfect silence. There are a couple of people, a couple of pages carrying candles. There's someone carrying, and typically another page, carrying a spear, and the tip of the spear is dripping blood. Then there comes a couple more candles, and then there comes a maiden carrying the grail. What is the grail? Our early sources don't say, but it's the grail. <laughs> and then that goes through. Now, Parsifal Percival, he has been taught, he, he is, as I said, very clueless, and he was taught by his mom that he is not supposed to ask rude questions, so he doesn't ask about this strange possession. So, you know, the, the banquet goes on, he's taken to a chamber, he goes to sleep, he wakes up the next morning, the castle is empty. It's abandoned. There's nothing in it but him in a bed and, and a lot of empty space. And he, you know, he gets up and he saddles his horse himself because the servants are all gone. And he rides out. As soon as he rides out, the drawbridge goes whomp up behind him. 
and he travels on a little further, still in the wasteland, and he meets the ugliest woman who has ever lived, who tells him, upbraids him, tells him that he is a total idiot, and if he'd only asked what the grail, what, what the grail served, what is the point of the grail, then the wasteland would have been healed, and the, the fisher king would have been healed of his wounds, and all kinds of good things would have happened. And so he has to start going. He, he tries to find the castle again, and he can't. And so he rides off, and story peters out at this point. In the earliest version we have by Chrétien de Troyes, it's an, the usual assumption is that Chrétien actually died before he finished it. So we don't know how that version of the story ends. In some of the next few ones, he does in fact find his way back to the castle and ask the question, and everything is fine again. So, Grail, what is the Grail? That's actually one of the questions that people have to ask in some versions of the story. You know, the knight comes to the castle and the question is, what is the Grail? The word Grail comes from an, an old French word for a serving dish, mm. the kind of dish you would serve a, a, chunk, a chunk of meat on or, say, a fish. But it's not, that's not defined in the early versions, as in the earliest version. By the time you start getting into the next round of them, maybe it's a plate and maybe it's a cup, and maybe it's a jewel. Wolfram von Eschenbach, it's a jewel. And it's called the, the, the wish for paradise. What does he mean by that? Wolfram doesn't explain. Then later, rather a bit later, you get the idea that it was the cup that Jesus used in the Last Supper, and it starts being drawn very much into this sort of Christian mythos, focusing on the ceremony of the Mass and, and, and the like. But that's not in the earlier stuff. That came in much later. In, some, in fact, the versions that I'm thinking of are almost 100 years later, there, when there was a very systematic attempt made to Christianize the Grail legend. In its early form, it's not very Christian at all. In Christian tradition, you don't have holy relics carried by women. Not in the Middle Ages, you didn't, certainly. And yet the Grail is always carried by a woman. There are various hints and comments in the legends about secrets. There are secret prayers that go with the grail. There are secret teachings, a secret, a secret wisdom surrounds it. And, of course, that all goes away by the time you get the late Christianized versions where Parseval is replaced by Galahad, a plaster saint in armor. And, and, and you know, it's all reworked into the, into the imagery of the mass and things like that. But we're looking at something much older and stranger when the grail first surfaces in legend. Mm. It's quite fascinating. And uh, I, I wanted to ask you, you don't address this in the book, but you're the expert here. And I was just curious if you knew anything about this. I know that the grail as a stone, I, I had read that before. Mm -hmm. And given that, I have heard alchemical readings mm -hmm. of, of the grail, that it's actually the philosopher's stone. And the other thing that occurred to me is that mm -hmm. the earliest versions of the story with uh, Chrétien de Troyes and von Eschenbach, they mm -hmm. are contemporary with the Crusades, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. the first thing that came to my mind was the stone in the Kaaba. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, are these connected possibly? Do we yeah. know? No, we don't. Right. Alchemy was only, well, that I know of actually, alchemy had not yet really gotten a foothold in Europe mm. at the time the Grail legends were first, first appeared. By the time the Grail was sort of winding up in the Christian version, the earliest generation of European alchemical documents can be found. But back in Chrétien's time, back in Wolfram's time, not so much. Alchemy had to be imported along with so much else from, from the Muslim world. Is there a possible connection to the Kaaba? Is there a possible connection to alchemical legends alchemical material in the Islamic world. That's a real possibility. Uh, Wolfram claims that the book from which he got the Grail legend um, referenced a, he quote, heathen, unquote, that is to say, Muslim, sorcerer named Flegitanis, who was the original source of the material. But many scholars these days assume that um, Wolfram was just making the book up. Similarly, Chrétien claims that he got his material from a book that was lent him by his noble patron. Scholars these days insist he was making it up, too. I'm not so sure about that. But as with so much with the Grail, it all sort of fades out in mystery. We don't know what was actually going on. Right. So the earliest written one is the Chrétien de Troyes. 
Now mm-hmm. that sounds suspiciously French. <laughs> he was well, yes, he he was French, uh, and right. yes, you you can insert Monty Python jokes about silly English kniggets <laughs> if you right. want to at this point. <laughs> Yes, yeah. of course it's French. Where do you think you got the outrage <laughs> accent? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, uh, is that the because when I first learned this, I mean, it's also connected with King Arthur, uh-huh. and I would not associate King Arthur and the Grail with France. <laughs> this is this is the place where people in the English speaking world miss a major point. Okay. And there's there's a there's a country called Brittany. It is on the on the northwest corner of France. It's now part of the nation of France, France having been conquered many centuries ago. It's in exactly the same condition as Wales as in England. It is the Celtic part of the French nation. Brittany was settled in the dark ages by refugees from Roman Britain and they took the Arthurian legend with them. Mm. Okay. So Brittany is an absolute bubbling cauldron of Arthurian stories, and it has been since about the 6th century. So, in fact, France has as much a claim to the Arthurian legend as, as say, England does. Mm. And, you know, again, they're right next to one of the major hotbeds of the tradition. Also, of course, it's worth noting that when the Arthurian legends got into circulation, they took off in a big way. Um, the, the Arthurian legends were run, the runaway bestsellers of the 12th century. You know, they were the Harry Potter of their time. Everybody read them. We have versions of the, of the Arthurian legends in every European language, including medieval Hebrew. Hmm. I did not yeah. know that one. <laughs> yeah. We have them in Latin. We have them in, in French and you know, Middle French and Middle English and uh, half a dozen different dialects of German and Italian. But, you know, going, I think there are versions of them in, in, old, in medieval Russian. Mm. And so basically everyone was crazy about King Arthur. And so, you know, everyone was crazy about all the other legends that were dumped into the Arthurian structure in the process of filling out the story. And of course, the Grail is one of those. Okay, so I think I want to kind of step back and mm-hmm. go back to the actual story. And I, mm-hmm. you know, there are a lot of threads that you address in the book, and mm-hmm. we certainly aren't going to cover all of them. But there are a few that I think are really worthy of talking about. And the first one I wanted to ask you about is the setting itself, this wasteland. Uh, Mm -hmm. which is a place of ecological catastrophe. Mm -hmm. And is this just symbolic somehow? Or is it referring to something else? Something that actually (laughs) actually happened. Right. Now, this this is one, that's of course one of the big questions. We have in the in the story of the wasteland, especially the version of it that we get in the elucidation, one of the one of the oddest and rarest of the Grail legend, which I which I discuss at length, which I also include a translation of in, as an appendix. The we have a a portrayal of ecological ta- catastrophe. We have a situation where due to human action, there are no leaves on the trees, there is no water in the rivers, not a blade of grass grows. It's really harrowing. And so this is the condition of the wasteland. This is the thing that the quest for the grail is meant to heal. Does it have symbolic meanings? Of course, everything has symbolic meanings. I think the world, the philosophers for thousands of years have been trying to point out to us that the world is, among other things, a dream that we need to interpret. And But one of the things that I point out in the course of in, in the course of the book is that there have been such ecological catastrophes before. Our current situation is not unique. We have, I mean, we have shinier, more more high tech ways of wrecking our environment. But people have been doing this sort of thing for a long time, using whatever technology they had available, and they did a very good job of it. <clears throat> So you have situations in, in, in many parts of the world where human societies have had to deal with the consequences of their own eco- ecological stupidity. And those consequences included things like famine and, and you know, drastic depopulation, the kind of thing that we see echoed in the, in the Grail legend, in the, in the wasteland. Now, 
There are you, people tend to think of mythology and folklore and legend as things that are just made up, and that's that's simply silly. One of the things that has become increasingly true in recent years is just how much actual information from the past tends to be stored in the form of old stories. I, I, I read a paper a little while ago where somebody had taken Australian Aboriginal legends about various parts of the coastline and showed that the, the Aboriginal tribes literally knew what the coastline looked like before the seas rose at the end of the last ice age. They described in detail back when you could walk across to that island because the water was lower. And the scholars who were doing this research actually did the necessary you know, scans and so on to find out where was the water level during the last ice age when the sea level, sea level was 300 feet lower than it is now. And it turns out the Aboriginal Aborigines were dead right. They knew we, they had, in fact, carried this exact information. There's similar cases in the Celtic islands off the, off the west coast of Scotland where old, old Scots legends of the of the drowning of various islands and various pieces of land around the islands turned out to be accurate. And we're talking things 9, 10, uh, 12,000 years ago that had been successfully preserved through oral, you know, the oral communication of stories. Okay. So thus it becomes it's it you know, we can look back toward okay, when did the last really massive ecological collapse happen? In Britain, and as it as as it happens, we know it happened around 2000 BC, right about the end of the period that produced Stonehenge and the other great stone circles. We had, there was a subsistence crisis, there was overpopulation, the the farming economy collapsed due to overuse of soils and soil depletion, population dropped like a rock, the famine and mass death, and all the usual nice things that happen when people ignore their environment. And so one of the things I argue in this book is that what we have in the Grail legend is a dim folk memory of that period. Right. And, you know, that's one of the threads I wanted to kind of follow a little bit. I mm -hmm. was I was trying to summarize the book and I was going to try to write it out. And I, I did it because there were so many things. But part of it was that what you just said is that these stories conceal or have within them mm -hmm. factual thing. You know, you argue for a temple technology. And then mm -hmm. there's also perhaps the remains of the some of the mysteries, the Eleusinian mm -hmm. mysteries and the mysteries mm -hmm. of Sibylle and Atis and mm -hmm. a few other things. And I find mm -hmm. that fascinating because it's I think it's a right way to look at mythology. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people probably chafe at it a little bit in the sense that they're like, well, no, you're saying that that's true. And it's like, well, no, but there's truth in it. You know, I think exactly. a really good example is, you know, the discovery of Troy, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that that doesn't mean that everything that Homer we got from Homer is actually happened, but that there is but truth it mean, to but it. But it means there's there's actual information in there. Yes. One yeah. of the things that, that a lot of people fail to realize is that storytelling is the oldest human technology for preserving and transmitting information. Mm -hmm. We've probably been doing it as long as we as long as we've been human. And we're very, very good at it. Right. If you start right now, you know, if you think about some of the nursery rhymes you learned when you were a child, okay, and those little songs like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star, I bet you can call them back to mind letter perfect, and you probably have to fight not to sing them in the same little sing-song tones you used right. when you were being taught them at the age of three. What we have there is literally... I, I think a hardwired function in our nervous system of those tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of years where our ancestors were preserving important information that way. In many traditional societies, children are taught these long stories and poems, and they're taught that they're, they're, they learn to recite them, they learn to repeat them, they get them letter perfect. You know, by the time they're ten. They, they're, they're, they've learned all, this, all the important stories. And then by the time when they're 70, they can still recite them for their own grandchildren. Right. And so in this way, information that's important can be passed on across very extensive periods of time. And so we need to look at mythology not as these quaint little stories, but as, okay, this 
is an information coding mechanism. This is a storage and retrieval mechanism. And you have to know how to unpack it. You have to know how to read it. But this has important information in it. And I think once we start approaching mythology that way, that, that's been tried. Let's see. Giorgio de Santiana and Hertha van Dechent many years ago wrote a book called Hamlet's Mill, where they tried to unpack some of the astronomical material that's included in mythology. And that's crucial because astronomy is one of the few ways we have of keeping track of long periods of time in the absence of written calendars and written records because of the precession of the equinoxes, because of some of the other things that happened. If, you, if the heavens above you are, are something you see every night and you know the constellations and you know stories about the constellations, you can say, yeah, when the sun was rising in this sign, these things happened. And you can remember that for a very long time. Right. So we've got all of this material that we need to unpack from mythology, and especially now as we seem to be hard at work trying to you know, recreate the, the, the wasteland around us, <laughs> maybe it's time to look at those old stories and say, hmm, maybe there was something they were trying to warn us about. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that it's to our detriment that mm -hmm. we don't remember these things. You know, we... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I always, there's a line I take from, I kind of change it. It's from the singer, songwriter, Suzanne Vega, and mm -hmm. I alter it very slightly to, we keep challenging the future with a profound lack of history. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's know. a good line. It's yeah, a good line. Yeah. And we, we <laughs> the thing is, we, we, think we're, we, we think we're challenging the future. The future is sitting there and laughing at us. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, for sure, for sure. So, so the Grail is the solution in a way to the mm -hmm. wasteland. It is what will restore the wasteland, but only if we ask the right questions. Questions, right? If it's right. just sitting there being a Grail, it doesn't do a thing. But if you ask, "What is the Grail?" If you ask. Whom does the grail serve? That's one of the others. Or in the German versions, you ask the Fisher King, what's wrong with you? What ails you? Mm. If you, under, if you ask the question, the spell is broken. The wasteland is healed. There's a lot of questions we're not asking right now. <laughs> and yes. <laughs> maybe we should try a few and see how that works. Yeah. Yeah. That's absolutely correct. I think. So one of the things that you write about in the book is mm -hmm. the grail is or the grail legend is conveying a couple of things and i think these are and please correct me if i get any of this incorrect mm -hmm. but there is this ancient technology that you refer to mm -hmm. as the temple technology mm -hmm. and i already mentioned the mysteries but the mysteries mm -hmm. seem to also be connected to mm -hmm. the temple technology in a way. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay, let me start by, by giving our listeners a very brief rundown of the temple technology concept. That's something that yeah. I actually introduced in an earlier book of mine, The Secret of the Temple. I had noticed doing, doing research on a range of things, including the Grail legend, actually, that there were all of these references to temples and sacred places having some kind of connection to agricultural fertility. And, you know, it's, we, people treat that as a folklore motif. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you build the temple right, all the crops blossom, whatever, whatever. And, of course, my response was, okay, is there something more going on here? When you go into Jewish legend, for example, you find out there's this extensive body of, of information about how you know, when the Temple of Solomon was built, it changed weather patterns. It changed the, the, the fertility of the, of the land around it dramatically. And then when it was destroyed, that shut down. Then it was rebuilt and it started again. It was destroyed again, shut down. So we have this, you know, things like that all over the place, all over the par parts of the world where particular kinds of temples and particular shapes and forms and structures were used. So I went to work trying to figure out could there be something physically going on here. I I do write about things that we will, you know, call woo woo if you like, but th that was not what I was looking for here. Several scientists have discovered there are things that you can do with terrestrial magnetism. There are things you can do with what are called telluric, what's called telluric electricity. There's actually currents of, of electricity moving through the soil. Obviously, they're not really strong. You don't you know, get a shock by putting your hand on the ground. But there's, there's flows, there are literally flows of electrons moving through the soil. There are a range of other forces that seem to be 
moving through the ground and natural forces, now again, not woo-woo stuff, that could be concentrated and directed by relatively simple means. So there, there was in the 1920s before the petrochemical industry took basically strangled out everything else. There was an entire branch of study called electroculture, where people were literally using batteries to increase the trickle of, of electricity through the soil and getting improved crop yields and, and, and less problem with pests. So you know this was done. This this was published in peer-reviewed journals back in the day. So we have these these physical processes that are poorly understood now. My thesis was that by trial and error, a good many thousands of years ago, certain people probably in Western Europe figured out how to make that work for them and proceed, that proceeded to spread as a folk technology connected to religion because I mean, they, they, didn't have, they, they didn't have magnetometers in those days. What they knew is that if you built a temple this way and you did these kind of things with it, the gods were pleased and so you got better crops. That was the language they used to discuss the matter. And so on that basis, the temple technology evolved and developed. It was, it was perfected in various ways. It was, there were certain variants of it depending on, on local conditions, and, but it spread through much of the old world and then gradually was lost because of, of changes, religious changes, and a great deal more. And so I, I pers- my book, The Secret of the Temple, is focused on trying to unpack what we can know about this, this lost folk technology, this vernacular technology. And, you know, the grail was part of that. The grail, the, the secret that would, that would make the, the fields flourish, if only you ask the right question. If only you look at these things and say, what's actually going on here? So there's the temple technology. There's that connection with agriculture. Now the Greek mysteries, the, the like the Eleusinian mysteries, the mysteries of Kybele and Attis, and so on, all of them were were linked to agriculture. The Eleusinian mysteries, the mysteries of of, of Demeter and Persephone. Demeter is the goddess of agriculture. That's mm-hmm. her thing. According to Greek tradition, Eleusis, the little town outside of Athens where the mysteries were celebrated, that was the first place where grain was ever planted. And Demeter taught them, taught them the people there how to plant grain, according to the, the myth, because they were so hospitable to her when she was looking for her daughter. And so the, all of these, these myths, are they, they have both symbolic and pragmatic connections to agriculture. My thesis here is that that was one of the ways that the secret of the uh, temple technology was passed on. You know, you become an initiate. You go through these initiatory ceremonies, not not completely unlike those of, say, modern Freemasonry or something. And you receive certain secrets that you you promise to keep secret, and that's part of the thing. You go, and of course, there's a there's a strong religious dimension and a strong mystical dimension. Also, there are various kinds of other things going on there. It's a big social occasion, among other things. But there's also that that becomes a medium whereby the temple technology is passed on. Right. And I also really appreciated something that you wrote about that I had never really thought about, but it was how the Greeks celebrated their traditions. Maybe the wording here is not quite right. On a regular basis, not the annual initiations into the mysteries, but the temples themselves, you know, we we often think of the Greek temples, but then there are also the temenos, the sacred groves mm-hmm. and oh, yeah. trees. And you noted that, yeah, the trees help preserve water. And once you start <laughs> cutting these things down and destroying the temples in the sacred spaces, of course, you're going to get soil erosion. Yeah. Yeah, the one of the things I I would have to I would have to go digging in my files to get all the papers involved. But one of the things that research into on the one hand Greek temples, on the other hand Greek agricultural ecology back in the classical period turned out is that turned up is that many many shrines to Demeter were located in the exact place where you need a whole bunch of native vegetation to keep soil erosion from happening. For example, right where a fast-moving river hits the plains. Okay, mm-hmm. you want a whole bunch of green vegetation there to soak up the water, slow it down, and allow the allow sediment to, to deposit instead of having it rush on right out to sea, taking the soil with it. And that's where you have the temples, and every Greek temple, except the ones in the middle of the city, was surrounded by a green belt. 
that was absolutely standard. That's still common in, in many places in the world. In, in Japan, for example, Shinto shrines are almost always surrounded by a green belt. It's part of the temple technology. And, but, it's, but it's also ecologically very sensible. In, in, Greek, in Greece, there were hills. Also in, in Japan today, there are hills that are set aside for the gods. You don't plant on them, you don't cut wood, you don't do anything. Surprising how often those tend to be places where if you did plant or cut wood, you'd have major problems with soil erosion. Hmm. Now, you know, so the, the, and the thing you have to remember is that the Greeks didn't have this concept of their gods as something way off there in the distance that you only really need after you die. The gods and goddesses were everywhere. They were right here, right now. They were gods and goddesses of things going on in the world. I mean, Demeter. Demeter is the goddess of the soil. She's right there when you're planting. <laughs> and Athena is the goddess of the, of, of the olive orchards. And, and, you know, every olive tree was sacred to her. The, the, in Athens, they took that very seriously. To cut down an olive tree, that was a death penalty offense in ancient Athens. That was sacrilege. Um, you didn't do it. <laughs> and so you, the, the idea of the old pagan faiths was that the divine powers of the cosmos are not way off there in heaven. They're right here. They're in the natural world around us. When, a, when, when you know, somebody in ancient Athens looked out at the weather and down came the rain, you know, we, t we say it is raining. Well, it what is, it? what is this it that's raining? In ancient Greece, they'd say Zeus is raining mm. because Zeus is the sky. You're literally looking, when you look up at the sky, look up, you know, upwards, you're looking at a god in ancient Greek beliefs. So they had that, that profoundly ecological intuition of the presence of the divine in natural phenomena. And while that survived until the coming of Christianity, until the idea that the idea spread that no, you know, the world is just a veil of sin and sacred groves are blasphemous and devil worshiping and all this kind of stuff, and you know, Pan got turned into the devil. We can't, you know, we can't have the the horned and horny goat god anymore. And you know, until that happened, they managed to take a, a very rugged, very ecologically damaged peninsula and thrive. And then afterwards, they cut down the groves, and the soil erosion picked up, and they suffered, I think, about a 50% population decline over a century or two. Wow. Yeah, I was going to ask you Luckily. what we know of when the temples and the sacred spots were destroyed. Mm -hmm. You know, I was going to ask whether or not there was ecological, excuse me, Mass ecological the, destruction again. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That's one of, one of the really interesting things about the, the post-classical period, about the Dark Ages and what followed. Depending on which side of the Mediterranean you were on, you had, and which, which part of, you had very different ecological results. Hmm. All across, of course, the southern, the southern fringe, all across what's now North Africa, you have Islam, which, you know, the, the, the Muslim religion was more complete in its rejection of paganism in some ways than, than Christianity was. And mosques, mosques, the, the, there are many very beautiful mosques. They are made according to a very distinctive architectural tradition of their own. They don't use any element of the temple technology. Hmm. And so people tend to be shocked when you point out that Algeria and Libya were major wheat exporting countries in, during the Roman Empire. Right. Most yeah, of the because... wheat that was eaten, in, was, was eaten in, in Rome, in the city of Rome itself, came from North Africa in what's now complete desert. Wow. Meanwhile, nor especially north and in the western half of the northern Mediterranean, you have what became Catholic Christianity, which was much more accommodating to some of these old traditions. You have you know, surviving letters to early missionaries saying, "Look, don't destroy the pagan temples; just take them over. There are many to use. You know, turn them into churches." And continue to celebrate the, you know, the uh, the traditional holy days. Just rename them for saints, okay? And so in that area, you don't have the desert, and you do have the continuing wheat harvest and things like that. Is the temple technology involved? That's a hypothesis that I offer because they retained a large element of the temple of the old temple technology while the Muslim world abolished it. Yeah, it seems to me to go back to this idea of the information you know the information is there we don't see it and it's so much mm -hmm. to our detriment you know when we look at these mm -hmm. myths mm -hmm. and stories i think that we just 
especially many scholars, you know, they're like, that's yeah. just myth. And the thing that came to mind was how mm-hmm. many of the older mythologies are based on fertility and oh, yeah. fertility of the land. Yeah. And I know that there has been this sort of, well, no, that's, you know, we can't think of them just like that. It's like, well, you know, maybe there is more to them than just fertility, but I think it's but to our detriment to just ignore yeah. the fertility aspect. That doesn't mean the fertility aspect isn't important. The fact that there's right. more to it doesn't right. mean that there isn't that. And one of, one of the real problems, one of the catastrophic problems, I think, in modern attempts to interpret mythology is the mistaken notion that a, mytho- that a, a mythological tale can only be about one thing. Mm. That's very simple-minded. And, there, we, I mean, surviving traditions of oral interpretation of, of sacred texts make it very clear that's not the case. In, in Jewish tradition, for example, every word in the Torah has four different meanings. Right. Every passage has four different levels of interpretation of which the literal is the least important. If I recall correctly in Islam, the idea is that the Quran, every chapter of the Quran has seven interpretations, and you can read each of them out. And if you are a well-educated student of the Quran, you know this, and you, you can at least understand some of them. We are really dumb in our handling of mythology. If, if you will, we haven't learned to ask the grail question. When you face right. the... You know, when you face the story, you need to be going, whom does this serve? Right. What, what is the purpose behind this? What is hidden in here? Uh, and because we don't ask the question, the wasteland remains waste. Yeah, no, excellent point. Excellent point. And, you know, one of the things that was coming to mind as you were speaking was, mm-hmm. you know, I, I have a background in the history of religions and mm-hmm. especially in American religious tradition. So I know mm-hmm. how sort of Christian fundamentalism came about. And it's no mistake, I don't think, that it arose at the same time as the, in many ways, the um, development of modern science. Mm-hmm. And I often will say to students that, you know, a literal reading of the biblical text in many ways shares common features to scientific thought and it's, Mm -hmm. but it's Mm single-minded. And like you said, you know, once we take it down to only one thing, which is kind of what science likes to do, right? Mm -hmm. And it's Mm -hmm. reduction to things that that Mm -hmm. we lose so much. We lose so much. Yeah. Well, William Blake talked about this. You know, may God us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. Mm-hmm. The notion that everything can be can be seen in only one way is is in in his in his view that's that's the blasphemy. That's the thing yeah. where we lose everything of importance. Yeah, and you know, watching scientists get in as as they do constantly get into squabbles where you have people who are arguing that well, factor A causes this thing, and others no, it's factor B. No, in fact, it's factor A, B, C, D, X, Y, Z, and a whole bunch more. But because you have the bias toward a single toward toward changing one variable at a time. Mm-hmm. You have the analytical limits of the scientific method, which can only really handle a very limited number of, of variables before it simply spins out of control and you can't make sense of it. And so, yeah, the, the, the tendency toward a reductionistic view of cause until all you have is just this one thing, whether it's, you know, the, the sort of, no, I mean, it's the, the whole the business of dialectical materialism, the, the Marxists always insisting that everything has an economic cause. Right. And, uh, you know, or everything has a has a psychological cause or a genetic cause or this cause or that cause. The world is more complex than that. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it also brings to mind the sort of the I'm going to refer to it as the new science of ecology, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. is a little bit less Mm -hmm. reductive and. There is a movement to also look at the myths of various cultures. Um, mm-hmm. The way it was presented to me once was what, ha- you know, it, it was like, what happens to the gods when the gods are part, you know, the are equated with the glacier and the glacier mm-hmm. is melting. Um, mm-hmm. But I think we need to take it deeper and ask, well, mm-hmm. how do these stories suggest that we maintain an equilibrium? 
Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, Mm -hmm. quite fascinating. Oh, yeah. Clive Ponting, many years ago, wrote a book called A Green History of the World, yes. The Environment yeah. and the Collapse of Great Civilizations. And he, you know, he made an extremely good case that it's not as though ecology is something we can afford to neglect. Right. It's really kind of silly to watch you know, the number of people moaning about, oh, the earth is in trouble, the earth is in trouble. The earth has survived ice ages and comet impacts and many, many more things. It's like, you know, the guys, if you can imagine a guy sitting on a tree, sawing off the branch that he's sitting on and saying, when I finish cutting through this, the rest of the tree is going to fall. No, it's the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> so, so would that make humanity the Fisher King? Are we, are we the wounded king or are we, Percival, the fool who's not asking the right questions? Maybe well, a little it bit of both? The, the thing, the thing is, there, there, there is no one. There is no one. Right. Humanity is not just one person. Right. Correct. We are also Amangons, the 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 wicked king, the elucidation who raped the maiden of the of the maiden of the well, and and set the whole disaster in. We are, you know, we have an element of the Fisher King in us. We have an an element of Amagon. Any of us that drives mm-hmm. a car is busy, you know, or what have you. You know, we we have the capacity to rise. To the you know to pers- to the stature of Percival, but in that but that requires us to learn from our mistakes, to realize that we didn't ask the right question, and try to find our way back to the Grail Castle and ask the question again. Right, right. Excellent points. Excellent points. So I want to circle back a little bit to the mm-hmm. Eleusinian mysteries, mm-hmm. because one of the things that you suggest is that part of the rights of Eleusis may have made their way into the mm-hmm. grail mm-hmm. stories that mm-hmm. the what was happening at Eleusis, especially when they were carrying the sacred items from Athens mm-hmm. to Eleusis, that you suggested that this may have been the original grail procession. Mm-hmm. Yeah, to, to, to talk about this, we're going to have to talk about the figure of Jesse Weston. Okay, who plays yes. an important role in, in, in my story. Jessie Weston was, you'd think she would be all over public, pub, the public imagination these days. She was one of the first women to break into what was then the all-male club of folklore studies. She was, she was the daughter of a tea merchant. She was able to get a doctorate degree at a time when women just didn't do that. And was deeply into folklore, was deeply into the Arthurian legends, wrote a whole series of very popular works on that subject, as well as a lot of first-rate scholarly papers. She was the one who originally caught, well, she and a couple of others at the same time, caught on to the possibility that what we have in the Grail legend is a, a record, a recollection of a ritual, of a ceremony that was performed at, at, at points during the Middle Ages. And she proceeded to try to trace this ceremony back through time as far as she could using the, using the material that was available to her, her book, From Ritual to Romance. That make, makes a very good point, a very, very good case for exactly that connection. And she argues that basically the, the Greek mysteries did not stay put in Greece. We know this. They, were, they spread all over the Roman Empire. We have, archaeologists have found, I think, what, six temples where the myth, mysteries of Mithras were celebrated in Roman Britain, which was literally the far end of the empire. You have, you know, ceremonial implements and illustrations for half a dozen other mysteries in, in Britain. And, and Gaul, what's now France, was, of course, much, much more, much closer to the heartlands of the Roman world. The mysteries thrived there. These were, these were part of the ordinary fabric of religious life all over the Roman world. Okay, the Dark Ages showed up. We get this. There are barbarians. The Roman Empire falls to bits. We have a collapse of social order. A lot of things were preserved. A very large number of things were preserved, which is why so many people in Europe these days speak languages descended from Latin. So her argument was that some of the mystery rites may have been preserved in a few places. They, they had already been outlawed by the Christians, and that hadn't stopped them from being carried on. We know that. And so what if one or more, what, what if some of them had kept going in northern Britain, 
in you know what had been the Roman province of, of Britannia, what was the location of a very large portion of the of the, of the total Roman imperial army back in the day, and, and you know was very heavily Romanized. What if these rituals had kept or had been preserved by people who felt that they were religiously very important? And down the road, you end up with a ceremony that looks very much like this procession, this Grail procession, and some of the other things that go on in in the Grail legends. That was her hypothesis. My book largely started out as an attempt to assess her hypothesis and see, hmm. since we have 100 years further research, we have more evidence about a whole range of things, how does it stack up? My argument is that it stacks up extremely well. Mm-hmm. And that what we have in the case of the Grail specifically, and this is another thing that Jesse Weston suggested, was that some of these mysteries, mystery ceremonies, had been picked up by Gnostics. Um, the, the Gnostic movement is really complex. Most people think of it in a really caricatured form. But there was a lot of complexity going on in the Gnostic movement. Some Gnostic sects we know, due to the docu- you know, we have, we have their documentation quoted by their Christian enemies, were into the old mystery religions. They thought the, the mystery rituals were important. They used them as kind of a first level of initiation and, and, and practice. And so these Gnostic groups picked up some version of these mystery rituals, whether Wesson thought that it was the mysteries of, of Kibele and Atis for various reasons, and carried those with them in a kind of simplified form, as they expanded into France, where they were, we had the whole the Albigensian movement, which was Gnostic to the core, mm-hmm. and in various other parts of Europe, you had these, you know, these various Gnost- these underground Gnostic sects, and that this was part of the, an important part of the process, whereby the the idea of the Grail, and the and originally the ritual of the Grail, letter the story of the Grail, and so on, found its way into Western Europe. Mm. Yeah, I was really interested about the uh, Gnostic component because I've done mm-hmm. some studying on them. Mm-hmm. And you link them specifically, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing them correct. And this is a group that I really didn't know much about. And mm-hmm. I checked one of the primary texts I have on Gnosticism mm-hmm. by Kurt Rudolph. And mm-hmm. they're, he doesn't go into depth. He mentions them, but it's the Nascenes. The Nascenes, yeah. Yeah, the, and... The, the, yeah, the, the Nazis are interesting. They they were kind of on one end of the Gnostic spectrum. Unfortunately, the Nag Hammadi manuscripts, the collection that we was found in Egypt in the last century and that has really reshaped our take on Gnosticism, was from the other end of the spectrum. And so what we do have is material from several Christian heresy hunters who copied down detailed Nazis documents. And, of course, denounce them six ways from Sunday. <laughs> but we've got the documents, and it's possible to unpack them from, the Christian, from all the Christian denunciation and say, okay, this is really interesting. <clears throat> that's what Weston was working with. That's what G.R.S. Mead, who she worked with, who was mm-hmm. a very important early 20th century scholar of Gnosticism. That's what they had to work with. That's, that's what everyone had before the Nahamadi manuscripts were found. Right. Well, I thought it was really interesting because you wrote about the Nascenes, and this is one of those ideas that is very much different than the common conception of Gnosticism, Mm -hmm. is that Mm -hmm. they saw God present in everything in the cosmos, and that God was in the material world. Uh, And that is very different than the idea that God is removed from the world and matter Mm -hmm. is evil. Yeah. You, that's and that's that's the impact of the Nag Hammadi uh, manuscripts. Right. They are mostly from the Johannite wing of the Gnostic movement, which is you know the the version we've that we're used to, where you know the human souls are trapped in this black iron prison of matter, <laughs> held prisoner by the wicked demiurge, who may be the same as Jehovah, and and our our sole hope for salvation is to bail out of physical existence to go to the world of light where we originally came from. That's one Gnostic myth. That's one version of the of one Gnostic myth. The Gnostic movement was much more diverse than most people realize. It was very complex. It covered basically the whole range of classic spiritualities that were focused not on believing something, not on practicing something, but on personal spiritual experience. Gnosis it means knowledge, but it doesn't mean knowledge in the sense of book learning. It means knowledge in the sense of personal 
encounter. Bentley Layton, who, who did a very nice, very good book, my, frankly, my favorite translation of the Gnostic scriptures, translates Gnosis throughout as acquaintance. Hmm. If you have Gnosis, you have acquaintance. You've made the acquaintance of God. You don't know something about him. You know him. Mm. And so there were many, you know, just as there are now, there are many alternative spiritual traditions that are focused on spiritual experience instead of, or in place of just believing, believing in doctrines or practicing certain things. In the, in the ancient world, it was the same way. And many of these groups fell under the, the general um, category of Gnostics. Right. And you know, you had the world-hating or dualist Johannites on the one hand, and you had the various people kind of in the middle, and then you had people over on the Nazi end of, end of things, for whom the demiurge was ignorant but not evil. Right. And the material world is limited. It's a world of matter. It has all these various inconveniences, but it's not evil, and we're here for a reason. And to the extent that we are going, you know, going. Uh, to the world of light, with the world of the eons, that's the completion of that's that's you know that's because we have finished learning the lessons of our stay in matter. That's not because we're fleeing from matter and grabbing an escape, you know finding the escape door and kicking our way out. Yeah, I like that. I like that mm -hmm. quite a bit actually, mm -hmm. because I've been really thinking a lot about this language of awakening and. Uh -huh. um, and, and and the various ways that it manifests and uh -huh. there seems to be this desire still by many to uh -huh. flee the world oh, and yeah. and i see this also in the sort of the new age with this idea of like 5d consciousness where sometimes <laughs> people are like well you know we're just going to become pure spirit and I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, I think that maybe awakening and enlightenment is embodied, you know, mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that yeah. we shouldn't escape. We need to, we're here for a reason. We're here for a reason. Yeah. That's the, the you, you get all of these people and, and their exact technological equivalents, the, you know, the, the, oh, the, the folks who are convinced, like the transhumanists who are convinced mm. that we should all upload our consciousness into robot bodies and go right. zip, you know, zipping off into the, you know, hard radiation laced vacuum of space. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, all, it's all this, that same basic principle, the, the, the unwillingness to, to grapple with, the positive as well as the negative of embodiment right. Of, right. of of incarnation yeah and i think that's one of the causes of our current wasteland oh yeah yeah, yeah i mean if if you if if you treat matter as as just dead lumps of stuff it's, you're going to turn a lot of it into dead lumps of stuff it doesn't have to be that way right and so the 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 nascenes uh, mm -hmm. the, I guess, how do I want to say this? It's the, I'll just say the Cathars because they're mm -hmm. the same as the Albigeni. I can't, I can't say Albigensians. that. Albigensians. Albigensians. Thank you. Um, yeah. The Cathari, the Albigensians, <laughs> they call themselves Cathari, the pure. Okay. Right, um, right. the, the Catholics call them the Albigensians, those people from Albi. <laughs> right, 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 right. Mm -hmm. uh, so they preserved some mm -hmm. of the classical initiation mm -hmm. uh, ceremonies from Eleusis. And I know that you're pronouncing it, is it Kybele? Kybele. Kybele, yes. So did they preserve both of them? We don't know. Okay. We're not even sure that the, the, Cathar, the Cathars were the ones, were the specific ones who preserved that. We okay. don't, the, the problem is Southern France in the period just before, the century or so, just before the Albigensian Crusade, was a bubbling cauldron of fascinating things. That's where the Kabbalah, the, the Jewish tradition of the Kabbalah, first surfaces. Right. It's where we've got the Cathars, we've got all kinds of other things. We've got the Arthurian legend suddenly boiling up. We have the troubadour poetry. We have It was this amazing cultural efflorescence. And then it got stomped and by, by brute force 
by you know, the, the Pope declared a crusade against the Cathars, and something like half of the population of southern France was wiped out in the, in the, the half century of warfare that followed. They exterminated and, and burnt and destroyed everything they could get. And so we don't know much about what was going on because so much was destroyed and so many people were killed. My, suge- my suspicion, because what we have from the Cathar tradition as such, the surviving documents, the surviving information, suggests that they were more toward the dualist end of things. Mm. But they may not have been the only game in town. There certainly seemed to have been some other things going around that were much more world affirming. Certainly, the troubadour poetry, with its with its frank affirmation of sexual love as as a good thing, hard to fit in with the sort of world denying dualist routine. And yet, these things were boiling around at the same time. And certainly, there were there were things going on there. There were traditions being awakened. That was always the most one of the most Romanized places in Europe, and so it had connections to old Roman before that Greek culture, until it was destroyed. Hmm. And a lot of the Roman culture, I suppose, I don't know, I don't want to say survived <laughs> necessarily, mm-hmm. but was also connected with this area along the borders between Scotland and England. I mean, we had that's, Hadrian's Wall, right? <laughs> yeah. That's the weirdest thing, thing that I did not expect to discover was, I mean, the, the material in my chapter on the borderland between England and Scotland, I would, I mean, these days it's, it's practically, well, I mean, it's beautiful. It's scenic. It has very few people living there. It's not quite a wasteland. I mean, it's very green, but it's it's very desolate in some ways, and yet during the during the dark ages that was a that was a happening place that was a very very busy place there were a lot of a lot of survivals i mean because the roman the Roman soldiers the Roman auxiliaries not the the legions were pulled back back, but the auxiliaries stayed in place they settled down they established kingdoms and the, there was a lot of the a lot of the old the wars between the Saxons and and the Britons took place there, and there was still for a very very long time a very rich local culture, and a lot of stuff preserved that that did, was not preserved elsewhere. So yeah, you have this region, and until really the High Middle Ages, when the, it became increasingly a border zone in the wars between England and Scotland, and, and you know became rather desolate for that reason, of course, raids from the border reavers and so on. Yeah, I was not expecting to find that. I was especially not expecting to find the material about the debatable land, the section of property of you know some miles long and wide, which was neither England nor Scotland, but set apart by traditional law for a very long time. That was a complete surprise to me. But you find these things when you research the odd corners of, of you know, right. And what would be the significance of the debatable land for the Grail legends? Um, for the Grail legends, we're not sure. Mm. Is it po- is it possible that it plays a role in some aspects of the Grail legend? Yes. What we do know is that it appears to be the the longest surviving of the areas that were set apart, the large areas that were set apart to the gods in mm-hmm. old times. There were various, well, we were talking earlier about how every temple had a green belt around it. There were also much larger areas that were marked off and said, okay, no farming here. Absolutely not. No farming, no wood cutting, nothing. You, maybe you can pasture animals there, but you have to take them off at nightfall. <laughs> and that's what the debatable land was. Mm. And weirdly, it's, now, this is an area where the worship of the old pagan gods survived very late. And folklore scholars, as late as the beginning of the 19th century, still found some very, very pagan customs in that part of the, the area where England and Scotland meet. It's an area where there's a lot of old temples. It's an area where there, you know, statues and so on have been found. There are there's stone circles, all kinds of interesting stuff like that. And that's the area from which, a little south of there, is the area where Jesse Weston became convinced that the Grail ceremony had survived longest, and where, in fact, she believed it was it it had survived into modern times and was still being practiced. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because Mm -hmm. you thought that she it's possible that she may have actually been initiated into it. She stated that she knew people who were initiates of it. Right, right. 
And Jesse Weston being Jesse Weston, she was not afraid to do. She she was not any your inhibited kind of person, okay. And so she hung out with G.R.S. Mead, who was when when he was you know a theosophist and an occultist. And I'm I'm pretty sure that Mead was heavily involved in the, this group around the Grail around the Grail ceremony. So I'm pretty sure she was actually an initiate. It would have been totally in character with her to do so. I can't document that she was, but right. but she she also in the in the weird essay slash story, the ruined temple, which was only published once in her lifetime and has not seen print since then until I put it as an appendix in my book. Hmm. The ruined temple is an account of the Grail ceremony in very lightly fictionalized form. And it was a crucial clue to me because I recognized elements of that ceremony in another slightly earlier text, which allowed me to con- make the connection with from GRS Mead going further back. Okay. And in that period of time where kind of Weston and GRS Mead, mm-hmm. they were contemporary with Arthur Edward Waite. And I think yeah. that you note that a lot of this heavy Christian interpretation that we have mm-hmm. of the Grail legend is because of him, correct? Well, he's he's part of it. Yeah. Part of the part of the issue is that back in the 13th century, as I mentioned earlier, there was a massive attempt to Christianize the Grail legend. You had all of these busy monastic scribes writing Grail legends that were absolutely Christian and where, you know, chastity is the most important thing and you know, you have Galahad, who is just an utter prig. You know, think about the landscape, be, you know, vanquishing people by his sheer moral purity, and so on. And and it was very, and all turned very Christian. That was the stratum of the legend that got to Sir Thomas Mallory. Hmm. And Mallory included it in his book, Le Morte d'Arthur, which is the great English language retelling of the, of the Arthurian legends and has shaped everything since then. So that played a very large role in putting that Christian element front and center. Waite, Waite was a very busy man and he wrote a lot of books. He wrote two books on the Grail, both of which treated the Christian interpretation as the only thing about the Grail that mattered. Some, one of which, frankly, was rather dishonest in its attempt to disprove Jesse Weston's ritual theory. He made some statements about what was or was not in initiation rituals that he himself had good reason to know were not true. But it, it's awkward. Hmm. There's a certain issue you get in certain people of devout Christian faith where bringing soul to Jesus becomes more important than telling the truth. Right. And it's embarrassing, and it's something you find down through the centuries. Mm-hmm. It doesn't do their religion any good because all that ha- all that it takes is somebody finding out, oh, you lied about that, and <laughs> guess what? But but I, I really wonder how many people have somehow managed not to notice that thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor is one of the Ten Commandments. Yeah. <laughs> but so so but weight weight played an important role and. Um, so did, of course, Charles Williams, whose Arthurian poetry was very popular in, in educated circles in, in England. And, and so did, crucially did the rejection of occultism in the mid-20th century, the hard turn away from anything that could be considered a cult. So Jessie Weston was, as soon as she was dead, people started pretending she never existed. G.R.S. Mead, same thing. They couldn't quite ignore Arthur, or ignore um, William Butler Yeats because he was a Nobel Prize winner, but they did their level best to pretend that, that he wasn't a ceremonial magician, as of course he was. And so on and so on. So we can go on for a week talking about examples <laughs> of occultism being swept under the rug and anybody who could be ignored being ignored. Hilda to do little, the, the very great poet was erased from from collective memory in the 1950s because she was way too deeply into greek paganism and occultism mm. yeah i i was familiar with the grs mead but i and i have Good. a book or two of his but i was not familiar with jesse weston and so i oh, really appreciated the introduction beeline make a beeline to from ritual to romance Oh, it I already downloaded very much, it. <laughs> okay, you got it. Good. You got it. Yeah, one of the great things at, at this point, we, we live in an age of free downloads, right. and all of this literature is available. All of this stuff can, can be found readily 
It's out of copyright. It's right there and waiting. If you want a copy of, of William Morris's The Well of the World's End, and mm-hmm. I highly recommend that, you know, hit, <laughs> click. Yeah. It's yours. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. As soon as I started reading about her in your book, I, I, I found her and downloaded it. Um, and but my guess is with Jesse Weston, that it wasn't just that she was an occultist, but that she was a woman as well. Um, well, but you'd, you'd think now that would be less of an issue. Nowadays, right. every woman, every, every woman writer, every woman scholar is the, you've got a lot of enthusiastic feminist researchers who are quite sensibly finding these people and bringing them back out into circulation. But Weston, nobody touches her with a 10 foot pole. Hmm. That's hmm. the fascinating, you know, that's the thing. It's, you know, when you have somebody who belongs to one of these categories that's now getting a lot of attention, who isn't getting attention, it's time to ask, okay, why? Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. One, one of the right questions to ask. Um, mm-hmm. So, so Jesse Weston believed or claimed that the ritual, the grill ritual was still being practiced. Mm-hmm. And the question I have in regards to that is, was this a continuation of something that was unbroken or was it more of a kind of a reconstruction of something? My working guess based on admittedly very small, very small clues is that it was a revival that they had a text Hmm. probably dating from from the 18th century possibly a little a little older than that but they had a text but that it had not been in continuous practice, continuous practice the evidence that i have suggests and again i offer this as a tentative hypothesis that william morris who was of course crazy about every bit of medieval culture and medieval literature that that he could find that william morris happened to happened to cross a surviving text got that into the hands of some people with connections in the Theosophical Society. He knew all of the early Theosophists. They had dinner with him all the time. And that it went from there into into Mead's hands, and that that's when it was revived as a practice. Mm. And and I don't know if you can answer this, or maybe you can, but the revived ritual, Mm -hmm. what would have been the context of it? Because before, you definitely had this apparently this agricultural context, you had the Mm -hmm. context of, you know, what was going on in the mysteries, but what Mm -hmm. would have been the context of this revised initiation, this revised ceremony? The same kind of thing that was going on in English alternative spirituality and and occult scenes all the time. It would have been, Mm -hmm. you know, a ritual. There would have been a group of people who committed themselves to it, who brought in new members. Probably most of them were, you know, educated middle-class people. It's the same people who belong to the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, who belong to the Fratres Lucis, who belong to several of these other orders that were very active at that time, the Hermetic Brotherhood of Luxor, for example. And they will have seen this as, on the one hand, kind of a, a link back to these old earth mysteries, but also as something that, something that could enrich and empower their own spiritual lives today. Hmm. So it wouldn't have been done to, I suppose, get rid of the wasteland. To oh, the, the the question is which wasteland did you have in mind? Right, right. Uh, yeah, as I was saying that, I was thinking that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, no, the thing is, I'm sure that a lot of people looked to uh, the, the people involved, you know, Mead and Weston and the other participants looked around and said, you know, here we are in Edwardian England. Looks like a wasteland to me. Yeah. You know, vast brick suburbs. Right. And you know, and, and a culture of stifling conformity. Yeah, if we we could use a little more life. We could use a little more abundant life. Let's do the ritual and see what we can do. Yeah. Now, for whatever it's worth, British culture lightened up rather dramatically in the decades immediately thereafter. Maybe that was then. Maybe Dion Fortune was doing her a little later than that. Her ritual, her ceremonies of Isis and Pan, with the same goal. And you know, ritual, ritual is effective. It even on a purely mm-hmm. psychological level, it can it can establish patterns in the collective mind, get people thinking in new ways. Maybe they succeeded. Mm, 
Yeah, and it maybe, was maybe they brought the '60s into being. Yeah, one. Well, it was pretty shortly after her time, I think, mm-hmm. or maybe it was contemporary that we had. You know, just speaking of rituals and the revision of things and reconstructions was the mm-hmm. development of modern Wicca. It was. It was just after her time. So yeah, Gerald Gardner was. Let's see. I, he came back to Britain. I think was it right after the Second World War. I think. Yeah, I think so. And yeah, yeah and studied with Alistair Crowley, studied with a few other people, and and started you know com- started combining the things that he he had received from Dorothy Clutterbuck, from Crowley, from various other sources, into the first draft of modern Wicca. So it was part of the same the same sort of general movement back toward a more earth centered spirituality. Right. At the same time, modern druidry was really getting its getting its feet under it. You had, of course, the the, the modern druid tradition goes back to the it goes back to the early 1700s, but it had been through various changes, and it was it was definitely during the 20s and 30s you had a lot of new ventures, and then right after the war you had the Universal Bond, you had Ross Nichols getting going and all this kind of stuff, and so yeah, there was a lot of movement in that direction. Right. I know we're running out of time here, but it seems so relevant to our current condition and our current Mm -hmm. situation that we're facing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I originally, before we started talking this morning, I was trying to put together some ideas that I wanted to talk about or questions to ask. And I think I've got the answer to this one. It was, I was going to ask you, well, how can the grail legends and ceremony help us heal ourselves in the world? And I think that the answer to that is <laughs> ask the right questions. Ask the right, ask question. the right questions. Well, the, the, the thing is, ceremony is much more powerful, like myth, ceremony is much more powerful than most people realize these days. Mm-hmm. We've been through this long period where ceremonies have become debased, they've been ignored, they've been bodlerized, they've been cut, and, and it has hurt us. Mm-hmm. Because a ceremony, uh, Russ Nichols, who I just mentioned, the, Druid, the very influential Druid writer and teacher in 20th century, in 20th century England, ritual is poetry in the world of action. Mm. What poetry does with words, ritual does with actions. And just as a well-written poem can literally transform the way you, you perceive the world, I suggest a, a strong course of Rilke if you have any doubts on that, <laughs> um, a well-designed ritual especially an initiation ritual, a ritual where you're being taken through these kinds, of, these kinds of experiences, it can literally transform the way you look at the world. It can transform, and it can do it in some very constructive, very powerful ways. And so one of the reasons that I, I reconstructed from the remaining fragments that I could get the ceremony of the grail in a performable fashion and made sure that, you know, that it works, it, it, all, it hangs together. You know, any group of 10 people can take this book and literally perform the working is because I think we need that kind of ceremony. I think we need that kind of symbolic, mythic experience of acquaintance, of gnosis in that sense, where, you know, instead of treating the healing of the wasteland as, yeah, this, this, this nice abstract idea out there in our minds, we're actually plunged into the experience ourselves in a ritual form. More generally, yes, there is the issue of asking the right questions. We have a lot of people who are busy on, in, in, on every end of the political spectrum who are busy trying to insist they have all the answers. Mm. And it is worth noting that those answers don't seem to be working. That is unfortunately as true of environmental activists as it is of anyone else. Lots of people insist, you know, we've got to have wind turbines, okay? How do those actually work? That's a question people aren't asking. Nobody's talking about how we can use energy much more efficiently. Why aren't we talking about that? That's another question to ask. There's lots of other questions they need to be asked. Instead of people presenting here's the solution. Okay, how do we know it's the solution? You know, here's the way we want to go. Whose advantage is it to tell us that? And so on and so forth. A more questioning attitude toward the situation of our time, toward the crisis of our time, is essential at this point. Because, you know, otherwise we just, we go to the Grail Castle and the procession moves by and we nod knowing that, yes, it's the Grail procession. And then we wake up the next morning and the drawbridge slams in our face. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, I I, I I could not agree with you more. I don't think it, it's, you know, we have to ask the right questions and. Mm-hmm. And, and, and we I have also, to leave, we have to leave our comfort zone. Yeah. That's what part that's what Percival did. He mm-hmm. didn't sit at Camelot and go, ho oh, hum, I should go, you know, maybe the grail will come to me someday. He saddled up his horse 
And he climbed on, you know, swung into the saddle and went riding off into the wasteland, into the mystery, to confront it on its own ground, knowing that he might not come back. We need that willingness to leave our comfort zones, to take the risk, to leave behind our easy assumptions, our easy, comfortable notions, and actually confront the world as as, as as it approaches us, to confront the crisis as it actually is, and then discover that the world may be a very different place than we think. So but you, yeah. you were going to say before I, before I started oh, ranting. And, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that That's perfect. Uh, no, I was just thinking in the terms, of, you know, first of all, you know, he, he doesn't become perfect. He becomes yeah. wiser. And, he becomes wise. You know, and it seems to me that that's what we need because too yeah. often I think we have this idea of perfection. And that's, that's yeah, that's the Galahad thing. We're yeah. waiting for Galahad. Lots of people thought that Barack Obama was Galahad. Oh, right. wow. Yeah. Okay. No, Galahad is not coming to save you. It's up to each of us to do as Percival does, to clueless as we may be, to venture out ourselves. The brave man becomes slowly become wise is what we need to be, is what each of us need to be. Right. You know, there is no, there is nobody in spandex who is going to fly down and save <laughs> us. We have to get up off our duffs and change. Yeah. Yeah. And to circle back to something I had commented on earlier, I think Mm -hmm. a crucial part of that is to abandon these notions of like the the language we use of awakening, because Mm -hmm. that is always presented as I know this to be true now. And (laughs) I always want to say, you know, to take it back to Percival is we need to kind of abandon a lot of the Mm -hmm. things that we think that we know and Mm -hmm. return Mm -hmm. to that sort of foolish state in a sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and the fact that awakening is used for that. I mean, think about how you woke up this morning. You didn't wake up suddenly going, oh, I know what the world is. You woke up going, huh? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) You know, if you're sound asleep in the middle of a vivid dream and somebody throws a bucket of water in your face, you will have an awakening. Mm. You will also be completely baffled. Right. You may be rather irritated as well, but I think in, in place of the image of awakening, I think one of the things, what, one of one of the, the the mythic images we might use here is Plato's myth of the cave, mm-hmm. where here we are sitting in the cave, watching the shadows dancing around. Of course, nowadays, if Plato were around nowadays, he'd say, "Yeah, there was people in the cave watching TV." Yeah. Okay, <laughs> but they didn't have TV, so he had silhouettes and, and things. You know? But no, we actually have to get up from the from the seat turn our back on the shadows and notice there is this dim light coming from off in the distance and go through the trouble of climbing up out of the cave into the open light where we won't be able to see a bloody thing until our eyes adjust to the sunlight. Yeah. So that's that, you know, the fact that it's not a, Oh, I now know everything. and I get to tell everyone else what to do. <laughs> no, <laughs> We've had plenty of that. We know how well it works. <clears throat> so, yeah, no, get up, turn your back on the shadows, and start the long, slow process of moving toward that dim little flickering light. Yeah, well, and towards that end with Plato's allegory of the cave, uh, mm-hmm. I, I teach this quite a bit, and I always Good. want to I always want to point something out um, because something is often left out of this and Mm -hmm. it's that the prisoner doesn't escape they don't get up by themselves someone has to free them Mm -hmm. and the prisoner prefers the shadows and sometimes (laughs) and in the Mm -hmm. way it's written is that someone actually has to drag them out of the cave So, so I, I do this in a couple of ways. I, you know, I teach mm-hmm. this in terms of Plato's metaphysics, but also mm-hmm. as an analogy for education. Oh, and yeah. sometimes yeah. it feels like that, that you're dragging them out of the cave. <laughs> you're dragging them out of the cave and they are struggling every single inch of the way. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but what's tricky is I'm still in the cave too. Um, but I think, I think that's also something that's important is that the prisoner actually, once they get out and see the light in the real world, they go back down. 
You know, I, th I think that there is that element. You have to go back down. You can't stay mm -hmm. blissed mm -hmm. out. Yeah, um, listen, like like Zarathustra at the, at the beginning right. of Nietzsche's. Right. You know, this that 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 began, which is both Zarathustra's going down and Zarathustra's downfall. Right. Right. German word means the same thing. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. It's 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 complex. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It certainly is. So, well, I thank you for being a good guide for us. You're and... welcome. Thank you. Thank you for giving <laughs> me a chance to to wrap it on. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I I do have one final question for you, and mm -hmm. that is, what do you have coming up? What are you working on next? Um, let's see. What do I have coming up right now? I have. I, I'm I'm currently doing a whole bunch of additional studies in the in temple architecture and sacred geometry and things of that mm -hmm. nature, with an eye toward a sequel to the the secret of the temple. the The main thing that I have coming out right now in this spring is going to be the first of a new series of novels. Mm. It is a an, an occult mystery novel. The title is The Witch of Criswell, and one of the things that I'm doing with it is that all of the occultism in it, all of the magic, is stuff that people can actually do. Oh. We're not talking Harry Potter <laughs> schlock. Okay, we're talking, you know, the the actual, you know, changes in consciousness in accordance with will, mm -hmm. and that that's going to be a lot of fun. I have, let's see, I, I have Ed, my 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 late teacher John Gilbert when he passed away in what was February of, of 2021. I've, I've ended up editing his works on the tarot deck and his works on the Kabbalistic Tree of Life. And those will be coming out this coming year also. Okay. I will keep my eye out for those. It all sounds fascinating. Um, Thank you. And the ecosophia.net is the best place for people to go oh, yeah. to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that, is my, that is my weekly blog. I post something every Wednesday. Okay, perfect. Well, John, thank you again so much for your time. It was an absolute delight speaking with you. And thank you I, for having me on. Yes, I hope that at some point in the future we can chat again. I will look uh, forward to it. There's a lot to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, okay. And that's a wrap on episode 72 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience or view this on Spotify. If you like what I do here on Rebel Spirit Radio and would like to support my work, then please consider becoming a patron. I spend a lot of time on each podcast episode and have plans for growing the YouTube channel, but I can't do that without some additional financial support. Right now, this is a labor of love, and I hope that if you find any value in it, you can help me in continuing this work. There are currently four levels of Patreon membership, Seeker, Sage, Adept, and Guru, some of the perks available include early access to videos, shoutouts to members, a members-only Facebook page, access to the Rebel Spirit Radio Discourse server, a monthly book club, and the opportunity to join me and special guests for what I've been calling Cocktail Apocalypse, Happy Hour at the End of the World. You can find the link for the Patreon in the show notes or video description. And of course, if you'd like to make a one-time donation, you can still do so via PayPal. I will be tremendously grateful for any support my audience can provide. Another way that you can help the podcast is to share it with friends, family, or even co-workers that you think will enjoy it. That really is one of the best ways that you can help and support the podcast. Although, money does help. Uh, as I mentioned before, I often kid that I'm here in the Southland doing missionary work in regards to religion, spirituality, and ecology psychedelics and consciousness and how all of this can help us heal humanity's relationship with the sacred earth so if you feel moved by the rebel spirit please by all means help share the good news also if you enjoyed this podcast please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts it only takes a second and your five-star ratings really do help especially if you listen on apple if you have a minute to spare please consider posting a short but positive review and please subscribe. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. I'm Nick Mather and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your Rebel Spirit.